Hello, everyone, and welcome to Getting Started with Legal Tech Projects, What's New in 2022, with the always amazing Fiona McClay. Fiona is a principal lawyer and consultant at McClay Legal, but I'm also absolutely delighted to say that she's a geeky guru with CLI's Legalpreneurs Lab as well. I'm Terry Modisette, the Executive Director of the Centre for Legal Innovation, and um, I will be hosting this, but Fiona will be doing all of the hard work because she'll be presenting for you today. Fiona did this um, session for us back in May 2020, and gosh, a lot has changed in between. Some similar, but a lot has changed as well. So I'm really, really looking forward to this. And uh, we've also got some really exciting developments in this space, but you're going to have to wait to the end to hear about those. So with that being said, um, Fiona, welcome back. As always, an absolute pleasure to have you here. Looking forward to this session and over to you. Thanks so much, Terry. So if you're on this session and if you're, you're feeling a bit overworked, like you, some of your operational systems aren't, aren't really optimised and you're not really sure if your, your business is performing to its, its potential, you're not alone. Um, we got a lot of interest when we ran this webinar last time and so we're going to revisit it. Things have changed in the past two years. What I'm suggesting about the way you can approach getting started with legal tech hasn't changed, but I have updated some of the tools that I'm suggesting you recommend. And I think that also there's just been a bit of a, a change in the mindset and in awareness and also in the level of activity in terms of being online, working remotely, all of these things that have flown on from the huge adjustments we had to make over the last two years. Well, we're going to start by just taking a, a bit of a snapshot of where legal tech is, and then we're going to dive into a bit more detail. This is a prediction that was made quite a few years ago now, but just to have a think about where you think the industry is on, on that move towards being tech-enabled and, and data-driven. And where do you think your practice is on, on that slide or that, that shift? If we look at some of the data, we can see that the top or the largest law firms have definitely embraced having a formal innovation function. And a, a recent survey in 2022, 59% of firms said they had invested significantly or moderately in technology when Thomson Reuters did a survey. Just looking at the global picture, this was a survey that was carried out of, I think they got 150 responses from different legal tech companies, mostly in Australia and UK. And you can see that for a, there's a fairly long tail there, but 73% of the legal tech companies were formed since 2015. So it's, a, it's a still a new industry. And the median size of those legal tech companies was is quite small. It's only eight and a half full-time employees. So we're still just getting started with some of the legal tech solutions. I think I found really interesting in that, in that survey of global legal tech were the, the most prominent areas of activity. The, the top five are not legal functions or not purely legal functions. So we've got document automation in the lead, operations, task management, collaboration tools, and then you get down to online legal service and compliance. So there's quite a lot of just basic digital transformation happening before we get to really digital legal service delivery. And if we come back to the picture in law firms in Australia and New Zealand, what are we seeing? Another survey conducted at the end of 2021, only 18% of law firms in that Altma survey said that they were using only client cloud-based systems and 5% of firms were using value billing. So a lot of firms still working in a fairly traditional way. And when they were asked what was the best software they'd adopted since the pandemic, the answer was Microsoft Teams and Zoom and other virtual platforms, which really is just table stakes for doing business during the, the lockdown period. 
we're really seeing a value of just general to digital tools and not particularly specific to legal. And there might be some reasons around, there might be some limitations, uh, people have been busy, resource limitations, but also some maybe some support constraints with people really not being able to implement tech and, and really drive adoption. You might have your own views about what's potentially keeping those numbers of legal tech adoption down. Now, Terry's had already introduced me and, and some of you will, be, will know me, but just in case you don't, I just really wanted to explain why I'm talking to you about legal tech in, using, in your legal practice. And I was a lawyer for 20 years doing litigation. Now I consult to law firms who want to improve how they work by making use of tech tools to deliver better client service. And how I turned from being a traditional lawyer, I, I'm not a geek, I, I don't code, but how I became a law tech enthusiast is a, a fairly simple one. I, I started in doing defendant insurance work. I moved to a, a mid-tier and then a small firm. And I was trying to do some quite big litigation and we just didn't have any resources. It was me and the boss. So when a big discovery came in, I had to start using tech tools or I couldn't sleep and I like sleep. So I got interested in this stuff and I just really saw the potential for us to level the playing field and be able to really um, maximise these tools to improve the way we could deliver service and, and for smaller firms to compete about against much better resourced opponents. And that started me off. I found that a tribe of people who thought similarly uh, through the Centre of Legal Innovation, that was key to helping me find those people. And I just learnt as much as I could. And now I'm sharing everything I've learnt in that process to help lawyers to get on this path to demystifying tech and get really excited about the possibilities. I now teach a subject with the College of Law about fundamental technologies. Well, what, the way I wanted to take this discussion today was to really look at some of the mistakes that people often make with legal tech projects and what you could do instead. And so those, those five mistakes are thinking that there's one perfect tech solution that will solve all your problems, choosing the wrong tech or, or choosing too much, having too many solutions having things take too long, getting tech, but then nobody uses it, and having a, a project sort of unfinished or, or finishing it up too early. We're going to work through those. I've got a bit of a, a framework to address each of those. The other thing I just wanted to explain, the way I feel that we can make some progress is tackling it in bite-sized pieces and there's a lot of talk about innovation and there's a lot of really cool stuff, but you can also make a lot of headway by just biting it down, sorry, breaking it down into manageable chunks. So that's fine, but if you are going to go slowly and in small pieces, what you need to make sure you are doing is you are identify strategically identifying things that are small but will make a noticeable difference and that will add lasting value. And if you can get into that habit of consistently making improvements that are delivering value, you will make an effective change to your business. So just tackling the first mistake that people make, these, these are the five-step five framework that I like to use to get started with these tech projects. And the first piece of that is awareness. So we, the first mistake I see is people thinking that there's one perfect solution that will fix everything. And sadly, no, uh, you may need to put together a couple of different pieces of tech, or you might just need to say, right, this does 70% of what I need and that's a good solution and get going with it rather than continuing to search for something perfect. I really strongly recommend that you start where you are. Get, un investigate the functionality of what you already have available and what you're already paying for. And the other benefit of really investigating that is quite often you can, in, we're going to look at some ways that you can test out an idea 
for a new way of delivering your legal services out of what you've already got before you go ahead and invest a whole lot of money with buying a new tool. So we're starting with what you've got. If you're looking for automation potential, it's built in in Word, in Google Docs, in Outlook. Have a look at some of the, the functionality that's been around for forever. Quick parts you can use to save snippets of text. Quick steps can be used to process information that can't, arrives in through an email. There's inbuilt dictation in Word, Outlook, and also OneNote, which isn't perfect, but for free, it's good. And dictating is three times faster than typing. So if you, if you didn't like that, the way of having to send your dictation off and have it come back later on, try that. You can just have your words appear straight up on the screen. It's a really good way of getting out a first draft quickly. Also mentioning Power Automate, that is a tool that's part of Microsoft 365, which you may have available to you, which can do a lot of the automated flows. So putting in a trigger and having the machine do a, an action in response to that trigger. And Outlook templates have vastly improved. They've made it much easier to find them. So if you are constantly sending, sending the same email to people, check that out. One of the challenges over the past three years is keeping tabs on workload across the dispersed team. And I just wanted to show there's a tool that is part of Microsoft 365, which you can use for this. You may have heard of Trello and Asana and other project management systems, and, and this is the Microsoft version. You get to it in Teams, and there's this Tasks by Planner and To-Do app. It's a terrible name but its functionality is quite cool. What it allows you to do is to put up all the tasks that have to get done. And you can approach this in a, in a weekly sprint. These are all the, the work that needs to get done this week. The idea is at any one time, you have three jobs that you are working on, no more, no less. Uh, if things are blocked, then you're waiting on something and they can sit there. And then once they're finished, they move to done. In your weekly block, if something else has to get added to that doing pile, then you have to take something else out. And so it recognises that there are just some constraints on how much you, your team or, or you can, can do in a given period. You can also see this list uh, as a list, as a, a bar chart, a pie chart, and as a, in a schedule view. This is what it looks like in a list view. And this enables you just to get an oversight on what everybody is working on, the due dates, and quickly get a, an upshot on how things are going. The advantage of this sort of system is that instead of having a check-in meeting where everyone goes around and says how busy they are, they update the central planner and you've got, you can spend your, your time in a meeting just checking on the problems, who needs help, where, where somebody needs some help. You don't have to spend time going around and hearing how busy everybody is. You can also align that with the to do app. And that can be where you are dealing with your personal tasks. So the planner is a representation of your team's workload. The to do app is your personal workload, but you can also have lists for life admin or other site businesses that you are running if you have different areas of work that you need to manage at the same time. And it uses some AI, it'll pull things that you've promised to do out of emails and you can put on the My Day page just what you're hoping to get done today. It can be a nice way of focusing. Another tool that I wanna suggest that you probably have available is using when you're working with a dispersed team and you want to give some feedback on a document, put this, the document up on the screen and record your comments. It's much quicker than writing a long email. You can explain why something needs to be reworked in a couple of minutes, send that through. And it's sort of the conversation you used to have when you were sitting and looking at the screen, now you can still be having that even when you're working and um, a remote or with a dispersed setup. 
this is a screenshot of how you could do that in Loom, but you can also do the same thing in PowerPoint. And it can be a really good way to communicate context when you are passing on feedback on a document. You can also use it for clients and you can explain what you were thinking so that when they come to have a conversation with you or a meeting with you, they've already understood the document because they've been able to work through it with having you explain it to them. And you can have a much richer conversation when you talk to them rather than them having to digest a whole lot about the document and give you instructions at the same time. So document automation was number one on the list of things where there's some activity in the legal tech space. And there are a couple of tips I'd suggest. Firstly, start simple. Don't tackle the most complicated agreement and try to turn that into an automated precedent to begin with just you know use your training wheels look look for where you can get a lot of shorter documents and get some momentum going really avoid over engineering it you may end up where you only automate the the fields for half of the document and you some things are just too complicated to automate with the tool that you have available you, you're better off at having automated half of it than holding out to try to do a really complicated process a good way to do it is to automate one central core document that you use quite often and then build out the the letters or the communications that go around that document and so then you end up with being able to automate quite a lot of your process for that particular core practice in terms of tools that are available, you can start out with the document automation and word processing tools like Word and Google Docs and Pages. And, that, and that's setting up the a variable field that just gets filled every time you use the document. Your legal practice management system may have an ability to populate templates out of data that's stored in a client card or a matter card. There are, you can buy some automated precedents where the, the content is already written for you and it will populate in the variable fields. Next option is to get an online clause library set up. So you, you would have your own shell of a document, but you're able to pull in commonly used clauses and repeat those. And then Another option is the low code document automation. So you're sort of using like an online questionnaire or a chat bot that collects a whole lot of answers to information. And depending on those answers, it varies the questionnaire. You can build those yourself. There are a lot of tools that enable you to do that now. And you can end up with content exactly the way you like it and the questions being asked in a way that suits your process or suits your clientele. What I'm a bit excited about in terms of automation is the ability for even smarter drafting where the AI is able to look at the library of documents in your organisation and it will recognise the content of what the document that you're working on and suggest content to you. So it's doing that work, you know, that we always thought we would get around to of doing the taxonomy and, and categorising and, and, and saving things into um, the clause library. It can, it can do that work for you. It can deal, anonymise the clauses and it can serve them up to you at the right time. And I, I think when those sort of systems really become useful, that will be the way document drafting ought to be. Just want to do a quick recap on some of the potential within Microsoft 365, which you, you may already have available to you. If you are thinking, oh, I really want to be able to offer 24-7 online booking, there is a tool for that. If you want to have your handwritten file notes converted into text, there's a tool for that. If you want to improve your reporting, there's a tool for that. So really just get your head around a lot of the functionality that's inside Microsoft 365 before you go out and buy new tools. You may find it 
what it does isn't enough for what you want, but it can be a really good way to get started and test out a concept. Once you've worked out it's viable, then you can make a decision about whether you want to invest in a, a, a top of the line tool for a particular function. If you are interested in the, some of the potential within the Microsoft suite, uh, I just wanted to call out a really excellent series that CLI hosted with Barhead and the Australasian Society for Computers and the Law, where it was really a, a good description of just how these tools work in practice. It's an eight-part series, but you can just find the ones that, that suit you, and it really shows where these tools are heading. I just wanted to call out a, few, a little bit of future proofing when you are looking around for tools where we, on this, this shift to a, a data driven business. Have a think about a, a lot of there isn't a lot of maturity in the way that lawyer, lawyers and law firms make use of data in running their businesses at the moment. But we, we have the ability now where we have this sort of automatic tracking of time. So you might be able to use that to get real information about the cost of inputs and, and make an assessment of profitability without relying on manual timekeeping. And you can also use some of the tools that track your communications with your client to really assess client satisfaction. Are they opening the documents that you send them? How long do they spend reading them? Data extraction is improving all the time and it, it's now becoming increasingly feasible to extract key information for automated workflow out of quite small sets of documents. Data analysis, we can be using that in a couple of different ways. There are tools that will do a survey of across the industry of what really is standard contract terms. And they're offering a certification that your contract terms have been independently assessed as reasonable. Just trying to shortcut that, that negotiation process where you say, oh, this is standard, and the other side said it's completely unreasonable. And to, to build in some independent assessment. There's also a lot of work being done in the US to use data analysis to assess judicial determination, which way is it likely to go? And for, uh, the way that a patent assessor is, is likely to, to uh, assess a particular application. A lot more benchmarking tools are going to become available. So you can understand, and insurers have been doing this for a long while, you know, how long it should take to resolve a claim, what factors make a claim go on for longer, that sort of data can be in, built into the way that we approach handling matters for our clients. And finally, risk analysis. Um, an example of this is in financial service where the regulators, regulators are monitoring activity and looking for behaviour that's an outlier or an anomaly to try to act proactively to prevent that sort of behaviour causing harm rather than waiting for the, a breach of obligations to occur and then there being a delay before you can address that. One final future trend, I think it's worth me mentioning, if you haven't turned off your notifications on your email and your phone, try that for a week. There is so much information coming at us all day, every day, and a lot of those tools are, are very, very useful, but really can interfere with our ability to have focus and to do what, you know, deep work. So... I th you do, you are going to need, I think, to develop some your own way of making sure that you protect your attention and your energy to be able to continue to do high quality work in the barrage of all of the noise and the information that keeps coming at you. So second mistake is choosing the wrong tech. And we've 
I mean, every, I think everybody can think of an example. You've been to a shiny demo and it looked good or your, your colleagues raved about it, but it just turned out to be not be the right thing. And Thomson Reuters recently did a survey and, and one in four legal departments had a failed tech project and half of those people said the primary cause was wrong choice of technology. So how do you, what do you do instead? And really don't start by choosing the tech. You start by choosing a problem. What you're looking to do is to solve a problem that will deliver lasting value to your business. Once you focus on the problem, it gives you a, an opportunity to say, hang on, is this a problem that tech can solve? Is this a people problem? Is this a process problem? I've gone to look at a firm and they, they wanted a new practice management system because it was taking too long to file their emails and they, were, they, couldn't, they couldn't find things. And it turned out that their legal practice management system had the capacity to auto-profile auto emails, but it hadn't been turned on. And actually what was causing the problem was that they had quite an inefficient process that involved a lot of delegation. So you, you want to identify the pain points and there are some, some common ones where you've got, you know, in manually transferring data, things take a long time, or people don't know how to do something in, in the tech that you already have. You can also look to what your, compliant, your clients complain about. And it's really important to ask around the team uh, and make sure, have, have you delegated down some inefficient processes? Is, there a, is that where you could be tackling some improvements? If you're just looking to make a, a simple change, you can just do a pretty simple matrix of if it, It'll be important, it'll deliver a lot of value and it's simple, go ahead and do it. If it's important, but it's a complex change, you need to make a plan. It's not gonna deliver much value, but it's simple. Well, you, do you really need to do it at all? Should you just make, make do with what you have? And if it's not gonna deliver much value and it's complex, then definitely don't do it. If you're gonna do a more complicated project, it's really worthwhile just to go through the discipline of developing a business case, making a, an assessment of the amount of volume that you need to handle. You can automate lots of things, but if without volume, will you get that value and that benefit? And how ready for change is your organisation? Will the, the team use it and will they promote it? Will leaders sponsor that change? Are there champions that will help you to spread around some enthusiasm for it? Going through that business case process can just really check, help you check in that you've got a problem that tech will solve and that you know how what sort of value it will deliver, that you can't do it with your existing system or you can't do it adequately. And that includes even if you invested a little bit of money to upgrade your system. You've tested that the, the tech you're looking at will be able to solve this problem and you've factored in the cost of implementation, customization, training and, and change management. And that you're looking, that there will be a return on investment or some sort of cost saving. And you're not looking in that first year, you're looking over a, a multi-year period. You can look a lot at the upfront costs and be horrified. You have to look for where, where's the benefit gonna come. And in part of that process, you have to factor in what's the opportunity cost of doing nothing. If you're be below the eight ball in terms of what the service standard to your, your target client base is, then the cost of doing nothing isn't that you'll continue on at a flat line. It's actually that your revenue will start to decline over time. I think another thing that's important to factor into when you're doing this business case assessment is just the happiness factor of getting rid of a really terrible manual process. And it, it may not be a process that's personally affecting you, you, but if there are people in your organisation who have to do things in a really stupid way, you have to try to put an, a number around that and include that in the picture. 
So third mistake we looked at was projects just taking too long, not making progress. And this can be because you didn't really understand the true scope of the project when you started out. And this is, an, like we keep talking about document automation, but it's like painting. 90% of the work is preparation. Putting on the actual, or coding the automation is, is the final step, like the, when you finally come up to apply the paint. First of all, you have to standardise your data. You have to clean up your, your data so that you're getting the right information. You don't have a whole lot of duplicates or incomplete data. You have to gather all your precedents together. You have to overhaul your templates so that they're capable of being populated with consistent variables. You have to get everyone to agree that the templates are right. And then you may also need to simplify your process if people have been used to working in a paper-based fashion. So make sure that you've had a look at your process and that you're going to be able to deliver the automation so that you're not, you don't get started with buying the tech and then work out you can't actually use it for 12 months and you've paid all those license fees, but you're not ready, your, your documents aren't ready to get into the system. I've also heard a story about clients spending months agonising over the wording of a template agreement and then when they gave it to the clients, the clients rejected it because it didn't cover key elements. It's another example of where you might be able to test it out on something simple first rather than tackling the hardest things. Another mistake is when you get the tech but people don't use it. And this is more common than you think. Uh, the majority of change management projects fail. And the research is somewhere between 60 and 80% of these projects fail. Now, that's not a reason not to try, but it does mean you have to go in with that mindset of really making sure that you've invested some time and effort in the change management piece to improve your, change, your chances of successful change. Luckily for the law, one of the benefits of sort of being at the tail end of a lot of digital transformation work that's gone in in other industries is we can learn lessons from what's worked. And this, the ADCAR model is one example. And what it suggests is that organisational change takes place one individual at a time. And so you need to um, accept that you're going to have to work people through these different stages sequentially. Just because you've got some training for somebody about how a particular tech tool can do something doesn't mean that they A, are aware of why they need to use the tool or B, that they have any desire in the tool. So go, jumping straight to giving them knowledge about how this tool can do X you're not going to get the buy in there because they haven't understood why they need to invest time in learning this tool. It also means that you're going to need to tailor your messages to different groups of people. So people who are up to, you know, that, that fourth stage where they, they want to be able to do this change, they need different messaging to people who are still quite happy working with dictaphone, uh, old-fashioned dictaphone, sending everything to through to be typed and having a bunch of letters presented to them to sign. If you have gone through these steps of, of a really strategically thinking about how this change will add value to your organisation and what the, the reasons for the change are, then it becomes much easier for you to be able to present this this explain and explain the change it becomes easier for leaders to um, be really confident in advocating the particular choice of technology and communicating that message to the team but it does require planning and it requires a lot more communicating than you think and it can be hard to communicate to busy lawyers who are working on billable hours because 
listening to you talk about a new piece of tech is unfortunately cutting into their day and they they'll be behind budget so you are asking people to move away from a system that's currently causing them to be efficient although they accept it's not perfect it's keeping them afloat and to step away from that and, and to learn new ways so that they'll be efficient more efficient down the track it's still it's a, it's a sacrifice of time and efficiency in the short term When you are, when you do get up to this point of implementing change, it's important to remember that people have different ways of learning. You need to approach your training both for visual learners, people who prefer to learn by doing and act hands on, and people who prefer to get everything by reading. And you'll you'll have all of the, those in your organisation. We have seen a lot more of improvement in the way that training can be developed and it can be made more contextual if you've picked up a, a new tech tool recently you'll see that you know you, you get delivered small bite-sized pieces uh, it's targeted to what outcome are you trying to achieve right we'll take these steps instead of the maybe old-fashioned way of oh here's the user guide you work out what you want to do and then and then you find the right section so it Part of this um, process of change is to really be presenting this change to people in a way where you're helping them see what they're going to be able to do by making the change. It's not just the tool can do X five times faster, but this tool will enable you to get your billing done and be out of the office in time to get to childcare. You, you, you have to be translating it into the outcome that they're going to achieve. I say all that and it's very easy to say that that's one of the things that I found is the, really the hardest thing to do. There's, I know there's good tech that will help people, but getting people to be interested and to try it, it is remains a problem. There are some people who just love this stuff. It's great, but a lot of people will be resistant. Um, Finally, the fifth mistake is leaving the project too early. And we, in that ADCAM model, that fifth one was really just being able to monitor what's happening and review and make sure that what you've delivered actually is meeting the need that you were trying to solve. It's, you can't just install the tech and roll out training once and then say, okay, well, everybody should start using it now. It's a continual pro process to drive adoption, to tweak the product to make sure it works. One suggestion I do want to make is when you roll out software, you, you might get a lot of resistance around, oh, it was so much easier in the old way. If we just made this change, it would be more like what the way we used to do it. it to be a bit vigilant about that sort of thing because you changed the old system for a reason. And the more customizations you make to a particular tech solution, you're increasing the amount of work that has to go in to maintain that solution. So every time there's an update, you're going to have to roll out a whole lot more work to make the same changes over and over again. So, particularly just in that first stage where you're, you're testing the product out, I'd really suggest not trying to customise it too much until you bed in how it works. So I just want to do a bit of a recap. First mistake that we found was that people thinking that there's one perfect solution that will fix everything. Instead, I'm suggesting that you have a bit more of awareness around what the functionality of your existing tool is and check that out before you go and buy something new. You also want to re really just being aware of where the market is heading, what, what tools are available so that you're not looking at buying a tool that is 
already outdated technology or where there is going to be a much better solution available shortly. And that can mean looking outside the legal industry. We've talked about quite a lot of tools that are just general digital transformation and the Microsoft 365 suite is an example of that. So a lot of the functionality that's available in that compared to the functionality that might be available in your legal practice management system, the, the 365 suite is, is making use of really modern technology so you just do need to make sure that if you're continuing to invest in an older system, that you're not going to be permanently behind. So keep an eye on where the, the tide line is in the way that your clients are able to interact with other businesses outside the legal industry. For instance, if you think about how the way you interact with your accountant, your doctor, or your even the pharmacist, and the way that they have moved on to a digital solutions. Just have a think about whether or not you're asking your clients to engage with you in a, a way that's no longer really making the most best use of modern communication tools. Second mistake is choosing the wrong tech or, or just choosing too many solutions, just bolting on more and more solutions. Instead of making a choice of cool tech or tech that other people are using that looks awesome, you want to take a bit of a strategic approach and be choosing a problem that you want to solve that will deliver lasting value to your business. And if you keep that at the front and you're looking for things that will add value to your clients, then you're making sure that the changes you are make are not just making your law firm run better behind the scenes, but you actually are improving the resilience and the sustainability of your, of your law, legal practice. Third mistake is if projects are taking too long, and quite often that's because you haven't scoped it out properly, so you haven't done all of the preparation work that needs to really deliver this project in an efficient and an effective way. A lot of that can be ironed out by breaking it down and starting with a smaller test and running it in a smaller element. And then once you've worked out where the problems are, then expanding it. Fourth mistake was getting in at not enough people using it. So just take up is inadequate. To deal with that, you really just have to accept upfront that change is hard but make use of the information that's available about change management and how it can be done. There is lots of information available. There are some ways that you can approach your messaging, but deliberately plan to be able to meet different people where they are in that journey around change. And also make sure that you're, you've upgraded your training and you're delivering that to make use of the way we can do videos, the way we can deliver micro learning now in a, in a way that the learning is tied to what people are trying to achieve at that moment. And the final mistake, leaving the project too early. So it's, not, it's like a puppy, you can't just feed it once and put it to sleep, you have to look after it. So you can't just leave, have the tech Roll, roll out a little bit of training and expect that everybody will use it and, you, and your job here is done. You do need to include in your plan how you're going to support the project, how you're going to tweak it and how you're going to reinforce change so that you continue to drive adoption. So I, one of the things I, I do think that these are the sort of non-negotiables when you're looking at tech projects you want to be solving a problem that your clients will value, make the most of what you have, and be open to doing things differently. I think those will stand you in a lot of stead. If you see that competitors are accelerating, you don't need to panic. It is at a very early stage of legal tech adoption, but you don't have time to waste on the wrong thing. So you want to look for the, a compelling priority 
and a tackle, a tackle it with a, a plan. The really good news is that a lot of lawyers aren't doing this well, then they're, they're not focusing on what their clients value. And so there is a really huge opportunity to improve by just making one micro inefficiency after another. Oh, if you want to hear some more about some of my ideas or some tools that, that would suit you or your particular practice area, I've got a book coming out shortly and you can join the wait list to get notified when that book is available. And that, that just expands on a lot of what, what I've talked about today about these different stages and that different framework. Terry, have we got any questions? We haven't yet, Fiona, but I'm going to encourage people to throw some things into that little Q&A bubble at the end of the screen because we'd love to hear from you. But I have a question for you. Right. I, I was, as I was listening to your presentation, and thank you for it, it was fabulous as always, um, I, I was thinking, you know, if, if you're sitting in an office and uh, particularly I think if you're a small or medium-sized practitioner, the amount of tech can kind of be overwhelming and, and even you know, you've taken us through this at a fabulous pace today, but there's a lot of stuff even in this presentation. So I'm wondering how do people go about making that choice? Should they, for example, be consulting someone like you? Should they be shortlisting tech companies and going through demos with them? And again, my, my focus here is on that time component and feeling overwhelmed. Um, you know, where do they start with that? Yeah. Look, and, and I think that, that that is a really common. I think having somebody external come in and talk to you is a really great, great way because what I find is when I go into a practice, I just see things that no one else has noticed. And sometimes yeah. it's not rocket science. It's just it's no one else's job to notice that somebody's still handwriting labels on, on a brief, you know. And... If you're a busy lawyer, you haven't got time to walk around and look at what's happening. So mm. there can be a lot of just small inefficiencies that are there. Somebody who's used to looking at the tech tools can quickly say, ah, oh, that there's a better way to do that. But I think the other thing is to really focus your your problem solving. So pick one thing, pick one mm. thing that's causing you a big problem and investigate that rather than, oh, you know, we, we should try to fix everything and sort of boil the ocean and getting nowhere. And, and then it's like, well, if I've just picked this one thing, I haven't done all these other things. But this is the whole thing about change. If you want to change to automate your documents and all you end up getting done is you fixed up 10 templates, mm. you're, still, you're further ahead than if you tried to bring in a great big solution and fix everything at one time. Yeah. So I think breaking it down into a, a quarterly goal or, or, you know, be realistic about what you, you're going to have time to achieve, pick one thing that actually will make a noticeable difference and just start making progress. Yeah. And, and the point you've made that really resonated with me as well is the answer is you can't do nothing. Yeah, right. You do you do have to start somewhere and start on this journey one way or the other. So the next the next question I wanted to ask you was again about choosing that external person. What what should one look for in that external person? And I know to some extent, obviously, this may be self self descriptive of of you, but but again, I think that's quite a hard decision sometimes about understanding what the background of that person needs to be. Um, people are going to spend money and it will be well spent if they get the right person. But what should what should they look for in terms of the background or, I don't know, the CV or other experience that that person has in terms of choosing that person? Yeah. And in your first call may be to the providers that you're already dealing with mm. and get them to come out and give you some more training or ask them the question, can I get this report that I'd really like but I can't make it work? So a familiarity with the system that you're already using, I think, is a great place to start because at least then you've ruled out your system can't do it and you have to look for an alternative and then you can start talking to formulating your requirements for what a, a replacement might look like. I, I think that there is a benefit. Uh, well, 
people tell me that they like the fact that I've been a lawyer rather than wanting an IT consultant. And yeah. that's because IT consultants often come in with a solution that really doesn't make sense in a legal environment. Mm. So they're used to dealing with other businesses which just don't operate the same way. Mm. Um, so some familiarity with legal, I think, is useful. It probably shouldn't make a difference, but it does. I don't think you have to have somebody who's been a lawyer, certainly, but understanding legal business is obviously helpful. I think you can also make use of some of the resources in the, the Centre for Legal Innovation if, if you are in thinking about e-discovery or document automation. And there are these mini series that go into a lot of really useful information. Mm. So you can get yourself up to a certain level of understanding before you start talking to vendors. Mm. What I really want to encourage people to do is to think about what they need to solve that problem before they start speaking to providers. Not because that they're going to be misled but just because so that you go into that conversation being very clear about what you need and what's the right solution for you mm. because otherwise you can be sold an excellent solution that does a very good thing but isn't the right thing in your environment for your team yeah absolutely Fiona I want to ask you one last question and it's this and it and it it's about clients because mm. you spoke about basically choosing the right technology and you know, in that is choosing the technology that obviously is going to be useful to you internally, but also presumably would be outward facing as well. How important is when is it when choosing that technology to have those conversations to understand your client base and and your choice of technology to be factoring that in in a fairly significant way as well? I think it's it's super important, and and we know that. You know, the number of millennials who are running businesses now is, you know, they're equal with baby boomers. So if they're, and as a gross generalisation, they don't like talking on the phone. They mm. like texting. Mm. So a tech product that is going to enable you to SMS your clients and give them updates and send them information or tell them that they can log into the portal and get an update, that's going to be huge for them. Mm. It may mean nothing to you because you would still like somebody to ring you up and have the courtesy of a conversation with you. So, so really understanding um, where your clients want are hanging out and, and the way they want to interact, I think is something that you do need to build into your, your digital roadmap so that you are enabling yourself to be able to work with the way that the, the bulk of your client base is headed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Fiona, again, thank you for a fabulous session, everyone. Thank you very much for attending. Um, I'm on the wait list for Tech Enabled Lawyer and certainly would recommend that you are as well. If you want to listen back to this as well, it will be a video and podcast, so you'll be able to kind of jump in and listen to this again. Um, don't forget, you can reach out to Fiona on LinkedIn or indeed through uh, lots of different avenues, not least of which is a website that you can see in front of you um, here, www.fionamaclay.com.au. I know that she would love to hear from you. So again, everyone, thank you very much. Fiona, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.